When you give a presentation of a patient, you're really breaking it down into five components. The subjective, objective, assessment and plan, and the disposition. Just like you practiced writing SOAP notes in the first two years of medical school, this is basically a SOAP D presentation. So if you've been good with your SOAP notes, it's going to help you when you learn how to present. So I'm going to go through this one at a time, and then at the very end of the video, I'll give you a sample presentation. And it's going to be very simple, but it'll just illustrate what's important. When you're talking about the subjective part of your presentation, you always start with the identifying information of the patient, their age, their race, and their past medical history. It's extremely important to start with that. Few attendings will tell you that you don't need to state the past medical history, but usually when you're on an internal medicine rotation and other similarly inpatient rotations, this is what they're looking for. After you do that, you have to do what I call the OPQRST, which stands for Onset, Provocation, Quality, Radiation, Severity, and Timing of the Complaint. And again, I'll go through an example in just a moment. You want to do the pertinent review of systems, the pertinent social history, and the pertinent medications. You don't have to include every bit of detail re regarding the patient's life. Attendings are going to get bored, it's going to be excessive, and you don't need to do it. But if you feel that some aspect of their history might be related to their presentation today, then include it. But you don't need to tell us what color their toenail polish is or how they did their hair last Wednesday when they went bowling. It's just unnecessary. Then you go into objective. You always start with the vitals, then the labs, and then your physical exam. If this is the first time that the patient is being presented to your attending and the attending has not been familiarized with this patient, you have to start with their presentation in the emergency department because presumably that's where they are and your team went down and evaluated the patient and now you're presenting it to see whether or not that patient's going to be admitted to your service. So if that's the case, you start with their initial vitals when they first got to the ED, then you give any repeat vitals that are pertinent. You switch to labs. You only talk about pertinent labs. You don't need to tell your attending every single lab value if those values are normal. Um, this will make sense in the example, but if, if they have a normal sodium and a normal potassium and a normal calcium, you don't need to say what those are. It's just unnecessary. You only want to point out pertinent positives or pertinent negatives. When you get to your physical, I recommend that you always include these four systems, plus or minus anything else that's pertinent. But you always do general, heart, lungs, GI, and neuro. It can be quick, as you'll see in the example, but you definitely want to include this stuff. After you do the objective, now we're on the assessment and plan, and it's really two things mushed together. It's your assessment plus your plan. So the first thing you do in your assessment is you always summarize the patient in one sentence. So you're kind of repeating the, the opening line of your subjective part of the presentation. Then what you do is you're going to give your differential, but you're going to do that embedded within a problem list. Um, so basically, you're gonna, you'll see this in the example again, but you're going to form a problem list go through your differential and talk about every single problem that the patient has and what we're going to do for it. So the work up to rule in, rule out things, uh, how we're going to treat abnormalities that are lab abnormalities, etc. The last thing you want to do, which, which actually should be in the disposition, but we included in the assessment and plan, is what's their fluids, their diet, and DVT prophylaxis. And I'm going to teach you something right now that every medical student should know before they go to inpatient internal medicine called the 421 fluid rule. So basically, a uh, short story. When I started my internal medicine rotation, I had no idea how you determine what maintenance fluids a patient should be on. And then one of my residents taught me this 421 rule, which I've been using ever since, and it's the greatest way to do this. So let's say a patient gets admitted to the floor with, with something and they don't need resuscitative fluids, right? They just need some type of maintenance IV to hydrate them. How much? How many cc's per hour do we put them on? They don't really teach this in medical school, so I'm going to teach it to you right now. This is called the 4-2-1 rule. So the first thing that you do is you go into the patient chart and you find how much they weigh in kilograms. That number has to be on their chart. It's going to be there, so just find it. How this works is you look at their total kilograms, and first you look at the first 10 kilograms. For the, each of the first 10 kilograms, they get 4 cc's. Then they get two cc's for the second 10 kilograms. And then for every kilogram remaining thereafter, they get one cc. And we're going to add all this up and figure out how many maintenance fluids they get. So let's do an example to make sure that you understand this. So in orange, there is the 4-2-1 rule. So let's say that we have an 80 kilogram man. 
how many cc's per hour do they need of maintenance fluids. So for the first 10 kilograms, they get four. For the second 10 kilograms, they get two. And for every kilogram thereafter, they get one. So here's how this works. 10 kilograms times four for the first 10. 10 kilograms times two for the second 10. So that's 20 kilograms right there. So what's left if it's an 80 kilogram man? Well, there's 60 kilograms left. So for each of those remaining 60 kilograms, they'll get one cc per hour. We add all that up and we come up with 120 cc's per hour and that's gonna be our maintenance fluid calculation. This is the four two, one rule and I think that everybody going onto an inpatient service should know how this works and how you calculate it because attendings and residents will ask and if you can tell them how many maintenance fluids it's really just bonus points because you're not expected to know this as a third year medical student. Lastly you have the disposition and the disposition is basically what are we going to do with this patient. So if you're presenting to your attending and you've seen the patient in the emergency room do you want to admit? If you want to admit which service are we admitting to? Is it going to the medicine floor? Um, to telemetry? You decide. Uh, is the patient stable to be discharged? Should we hold them in the emergency department pending some tests that they're getting? Uh, this is all stuff that you should decide and put in your presentation. So we're going to get into a sample presentation here. So let's say that we have a patient with, who, who's presenting with left lower quadrant pain. Um, I'm going to run through this presentation. It's going to be pretty simplified, but it'll give you the idea of how you're actually supposed to do this when you're presenting a patient. So let's say I've gone, I've gone through the chart. I've examined the patient in the emergency room. I've taken a few minutes to gather my thoughts. I, I wrote this down. Um, I jotted down some notes on, on my little clipboard and I'm ready to talk to my attending. My attending and my resident are standing there and the attending says, all right, what's up? So this is exactly what I would say. This is a 68 year old Caucasian male with a past medical history of type two diabetes, diverticulosis, and a benign brain tumor status post resection who presents today complaining of abdominal pain. So he's had progressively worsening left lower quadrant pain for the past four hours uh, rated at 9 out of 10 in intensity at its maximum, but it's currently 5 out of 10 in the ED right now. He describes the pain as sharp and stabbing, non-radiating pain that's pretty, pretty much fixed to the left lower quadrant. Nothing makes the pain better, and it's worsened with ambulation. Patient first noticed the pain uh, right after breakfast, and since then it's been colicky. He feels it every 30 seconds, and it lasts for about 5 seconds. He tried some over-the-counter Tylenol and a heating pad, but neither of those things helped. He endorses subjective fevers, nausea, and decreased bowel movements, but he, he denies vomiting, testicular pain, hematuria, or bloody stools. He's well controlled on metformin and has been in the ED once before for a similar presentation, which ended up being diagnosed as diverticulosis. So I'm going to pause for a second, guys, and, and kind of go through what I just did there with my subjective part of my presentation. So the first thing I did, like I said, overview of the patient, their age, their race, and their past medical history. Then I jumped right into the OPQRST. I told you everything that you needed to know about the actual complaint, right? Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and timing. After that, I did a pertinent review of systems. So I didn't tell you every single thing about the patient, but I told you that he, you know, some GI stuff, some GU stuff, anything that this could be, I kind of want to uh, rule in or rule that out with some pertinent review of systems. And then the last thing I did, I did a really brief med social. Uh, I just told you that he's well controlled on metformin and he's been in the ED once before for a similar presentation. Um, could I have said that he's a smoker? Maybe. I could have talked about his diet. Again, you're not expected to do, include everything. Just get through this quickly. If your attending wants you to, to, to comment on something, they'll stop you and they'll ask. So I, I could have been giving this presentation and maybe the attending cuts me off and says, um, is he a smoker? And I would have to know that. So it, it's good to know, but you don't have to include everything. So that's the subjective part of the presentation. Once I'm finished with that, I jump into my objective. So this is what I would say. Initial vitals taken in the ED, um, he had a blood pressure of 136 over 84, heart rate of 98, respiratory rate of 14, and his temp was 38.4 degrees Celsius. Repeat vitals um, were significant for a temperature of 38.4 degrees Celsius and, and everything else was within normal limits. His pertinent labs, uh, he's got a lactic acid of 3, a white count of 13, his glucose is 288. All of his other labs are within normal limits. On exam, he appears in moderate distress. Uh, his heart sounds are regular in rate and rhythm and without murmurs, rubs, or gallops. His lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. He's moving air well. 
His bowel sounds are present in all four quadrants. His abdomen is soft and, and really only tender in the left lower quadrant. He has no rebound tenderness or involuntary guarding, no CVA tenderness. He's alert and oriented times three. His cranial nerves are all grossly intact, and he's got normal sensation and motor control in all extremities. What I did here, guys, um, started with the vitals then went to the pertinent labs. As you can tell, I only included three labs, right? What's abnormal, what's related to this complaint? Um, if he had a really low hemoglobin, I would have included that because maybe this is like some type of GI bleed. And, and since it's a GI complaint, I would obviously include it. But the fact that it presumably his hemoglobin is normal, I don't need to say that. But if the attending asks, I should have that knowledge ready to say, no, hemoglobin is normal and then state the value. I jump into my physical exam. If you look, I started with how he appears. Always start with how the patient appears, right? He appears in no apparent distress. He is well-groomed, appropriate in appearance, and in no apparent distress. Um, my patient is in moderate distress. I could have added that he was, um, you know, slouched over clutching his stomach, but he's not. I'm making this up. Um, then I do heart, lungs, GI, and neuro. Always include if the patient is alert and oriented and because you want to, like, are they in shock? Are they not? What's going on? The attending hasn't seen this patient yet, but um, I'm creating this picture of what the patient looks like so that when my attending goes to see the patient, they already are armed with the knowledge. And that's really what the presentation is all about. You have to tell your attending what to expect. And if they confirm that when they go and see the patient themselves, that looks really good for you and you're going to get that honors. So now I'm going to jump to my assessment and plan. So again, the first thing you do on your assessment is you stop and you summarize in one sentence the patient. So you're kind of just repeating your original opener from the subjective line. So I say, okay, so my assessment is that this is a 68-year-old Caucasian male with a history of type 2 diabetes, diverticulosis, and benign brain tumor status post-resection who presents today complaining of left lower quadrant abdominal pain. The next thing that you do is you create this problem list. And within the problem list, you usually include your differential. So I, you break it down by problem. So say problem number one is the left lower quadrant abdominal pain. And this is where your differential is. So I think this is likely diverticulitis versus a viral gastroenteritis versus unlikely testicular torsion versus diabetic ketoacidosis. I'd like to get a CT scan to see if this is diverticulitis. Um, repeat the white cell count and the lactate, and then pending the results, we'll start antibiotics. Um, problem number two is his lactic acidosis and his white cell count. So this is likely secondary to diverticulitis. I would like to monitor for testicular pain in the event that any should arise just to rule out testicular torsion. Um, if the lactate and the white count do not resolve and the, and the CT is unremarkable, maybe we can consider um, a side effect of metformin, but I think that that's unlikely. Diverticulosis is problem number three. Uh, the patient has not taken any fiber supplements in the past year and, and admits to being non-compliant with dietary recommendations. I think we should resume a fiber supplement and counsel him about his dietary habits. Problem number four is his type 2 diabetes. His glucose in the ED was 288, but his last A1C that we have on record, which is done three months ago, was 6.8. So we're going to hold, I think we should hold his metformin, and if needed, we can start a sliding scale if his glucose continues to be high. Problem number five, his benign brain tumor uh, status post-resection is stable. Um, problem number six, DVT prophylaxis, we should put on compression stockings. His maintenance fluids, I'd like to do 120 cc's per hour. And for his diet, uh, we'll do a diabetic diet with a little bit of increased fiber. All right, guys, so basically what I did there is I went through all of his problems and, and commented on them and said what we need to do, if anything. At the end of your presentation, you need three things every single time. DVT prophylaxis, right? What are we going to do if this patient's going to be admitted and laying in a bed for a few days to a few weeks, right? We, we don't want to cause anybody to get a DVT because they're not going to be moving. So usually it's either stockings or some type of heparin. So um, do a little research in that and, and, and see how you determine whether you do stockings or heparin, but always include it. Maintenance fluids, you're going to do the 4-2-1 rule. So Pretend this patient was the 80 kilogram patient from our example. I'm just, I stated that he should get 120 cc's per hour. Um, that's going to be of normal saline. I didn't include that, but normal saline. And then diet, always talk about what diet they're going to be on. So if they're diabetic, they need a diabetic diet. If, if they have celiac, they need a gluten-free diet. Um, if they're presenting with something where they can't eat, like maybe a bowel obstruction or pancreatitis or something, you're going to say NPO. So 
figure it out. You know, what diet are they going to be on? And I, I commented that we should increase his fiber. So that's how you do the assessment and plan. And the assessment and plan is probably the most important part of the presentation because it, it demonstrates your knowledge of what's going on, what's, what's relevant here, and what do we need to be concerned about. When you, when you present the assessment and plan, what a lot of people do, which is not correct, is they state a differential first. And you never want to do that. The, the way that you should do this is break it down into a problem list. Say the, and the problem list should be in decreasing order of severity. So the most pertinent thing today is the abdominal pain, right? That's why the patient's here. So then we say, what could cause the abdominal pain? And then I give you my differential from within problem number one. So that's how you, you approach this. You do that summary line at the beginning, right? My assessment is that this is a blah, 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 with blah, 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 who presents with blah, 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 blah. The first problem is this. And here's what I think that could be. A versus B versus C versus D. When you state the differential, start, you can use the word likely versus unlikely. I love to do that. And attendings really like that too, because it shows that you can kind of triage what's important. You, you want to start with the most likely thing. You want to start with, then you want to go to something that can mimic that. You want to talk about something that is potentially life-threatening that you, you should rule out. And if there's anything else, you can throw that in. So I threw in DKA because he has diabetes. He's on metformin. Metformin causes lactic acidosis. Um, DKA causes abdominal pain. Maybe this is that. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Um, and then you just go through the problem list. You, you, you also include their past medical history as problems and state whether it's stable or not if you have to do anything. If a, if a patient has a history of some type of disease and they're on a medication for it, you need to decide, are we going to hold that medication? Are we going to continue the home regimen? That, that's all that's got to be in your assessment and plan. And then the last thing, and probably the easiest thing is your disposition. What are we going to do with this patient? So if I was presenting this patient, I'm concerned that he has diverticulitis and I want to admit him to the medicine floor so that he can um, get some IV antibiotics and get better under our auspices. So I say, and for this patient's disposition, I think we should admit him to the medicine floor. My presentation's over. My attending is crying because it was such a beautiful oral presentation. And I promise you at the end, I will get the honors. And when I'm on my residency interview, the program director will say, ah, you got honors in internal medicine. You must be a smart cookie. Dirty USMLE guys, learn this presentation. Good luck.